intelligence research tries to build intelligent autonomous systems. Luc Steels, Universitat Pompeu Fabra, Barcelona. On the 9th of November 1989, I think I was just doing my usual busy work, but remember a relief that this source of tension in Europe was finally disappearing. All right, it's great to be here and um, let me start with a picture in front of my uh, lab in Brussels, the Sony Computer Science Lab, and uh, one of my tasks there is to walk the dog. Now, this is not a living dog, it's, it's a, a robot dog, right? And people ask, what does this the dog do? Well, it doesn't do anything except just the kind of stuff that dogs in Paris do on the streets. Um, and so it, it's an example, actually, of a robot. You might think it's a sort of toy, but actually it's full of very complicated stuff, computers at least as powerful as you will find on, on your smartphone, extra memory, sensory boards for doing vision, cameras, microphones. And this is the kind of robot that we can uh, build today. But one thing, you see, this robot is not doing at all what I would like it to do, which is to walk. Um, and so the question is, how can we communicate with robots? And this is the, this is the kind of wall that I want to break, if you wish. You know, robots for me is another type of species, right? So the question is, uh, how can we communicate with it? Now here is another robot built by uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro, and he, I guess he doesn't like dogs, so he, he made a copy of himself. And he made that copy 10 years ago, so now it's a bit of a trouble because he has to uh, consider uh, cosmetic surgery to still look like his robot. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, the robot, well, doesn't do that much, but he's interested also to communicate with this robot. So uh, he's using a, a technique based on pattern recognition. Yeah, let's just look at the, the conversation I had. Maybe the sound can be a bit higher. No one knows, as far as I know, why, do you? Well, there is a program that talks like you, called Eliza. Yeah, I can program in Java. In Java? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very impressive. So, I write, thank you. I write mostly in Lisp. Thank you. <laughs> well, there you go again, trying to... Well, you see, uh, if you analyze this conversation, uh, then this, this pattern-based recognition approach, even though some people very much believe in it, is actually not really leading to understanding, right? I mean, the robot picks up uh, Eliza, maybe parses it as Java or program and thinks that it's about programming, you know, and then it gives a reaction, which is often a, a canned phrase that's pre-prepared and some slots are being filled in. I don't think that this is the way that we want to communicate with robots. It's not really communication. It's a sort of uh, pattern recognition. Now, there's another approach, and I'm going to show you an example uh, that was developed by um, Michael Bates and his, uh, his team in uh, Munich. And they had this idea, this obsession, you might say, that the robot would make pancakes. Now, this is in itself a very laudable goal, <laughs> but they had the extra thing that they could just tell the robot um, to create, uh, well, to make pancakes, just in language, right? And the robot would go on the web, would look for a recipe for making robots, and it would find this one, for example, and then would analyze it and come up with a plan and basically then uh, try to find the, the uh, materials for it. So there's Mondamin Pfannkuchen Teich Mix, which had to be found. So it goes in an in a, a online internet store to find a picture of, the, of that. And then it goes in, in the kitchen and it opens the refrigerator and actually picks out uh, this, uh, this uh, Pfannkuchen Teich. And then, you know, starts to work with another robot. So there's cooperative activity here to actually make the pancake. And, uh, well, they don't eat the pancake, but I guess this is the next step in robotic evolution. Now, this is extremely impressive, 
because as opposed to this shallow pattern recognition style, you know, they really bite the bullet, right? They, you could say it is intelligent design in the sense that they study very hard how language can be parsed, how knowledge can be represented. They have a planning system. They do visual analysis. And then they do all the robot control, you know, for picking up a plate, for example. You see the other robot on the left there already busy with uh, making the pancake. So this is fantastic. The problem is that it takes an incredible amount of work, an army of graduate students, to actually implement all of this. And so even though it, it is a, a great step forward, the question is really, is this is the road that we, we have to follow? <laughs> now, um, so I personally believe that there's, there's an other road, okay? And uh, this brings us to um, the idea is to, to actually follow the same path as we have been using, which is a kind of evolutionary path. Okay, and here we see Darwin is a, the grand old man of, of evolution, which of course has revolutionized biology. And the question is, if we would start using evolutionary approaches also in biology to get, to see how uh, cognition, how knowledge, and how language could emerge. And this is a topic that I've been working on because I'm interested in this communication uh, with the robots in language. You know, how can we find out what are the strategies, what are the mechanisms that can lead actually to the emergence of language, not our language that we put in the robot, but a language that they have created themselves. And so the kinds of experiments that we do in, in my lab, this is a, a scene uh, of experiments in Tokyo, is that we take a robot and we let the robot play with itself, within boundaries, of course. <laughs> now, uh, what the robot is doing is to move with the body and to look at its hands and at the same time building a kind of internal simulation or using an internal simulation and that way learn about the relationships between what the robot is looking like and what other robots look like and the motor control and the internal simulation so that they can plan about it. Another thing that we are uh, doing I guess I have to push two times, is to we set up experiments in which these robots play language games with each other. We create a, a small environment with blocks and so on, and this is an experiment for spatial language in which the robots are walking around in this environment finding objects that they want to talk about in the sense of uh, that one robot draws the attention of another robot to one of the blocks. And so you see on the top, well, on the left, Bottom there you see what one robot is seeing, you see what the other robot is seeing, and at the top you see the vision system that's working on this robot to attempt to make sense of the world. And so the robots play language games in the sense that they, um, you know, do something, well, one robot will say something, the other one will point to the object that he believes the other robot is referring to. But the interesting thing is that the experiment starts without any presupposed language. So we give strategies to the robots for creating their own language, for creating their own distinctions. So I'm, I'm going to show now a little uh, video clip which um, uh, shows the experiments that I've been doing together with Manfred Hilt, who is also here, and his fantastic team at the Humboldt University. And he created a robot which is also here sitting uh, in the audience, in fact. Maybe you can show it. Um, and so the robot is carefully listening to me to find out the, the history of his own species, I would say. Okay, so, so now this is... Uh... Luke is taking me to a lab on the outskirts of the city to show me some robots that are starting to do something remarkable. This is not such wow. a but... There's three of them. So, and they're, they're much larger than I thought they were going to be. These robots have been set up to develop, much like a young child does. They're beginning to understand how their bodies work by looking at a reflection of themselves. You've got a mirror here, so what's the... Well, the experiment is about that the robot would learn something about its own body. 
because in order to move in the world, in order to uh, control it, in order to also recognize the movements of another, you need to have some sort of model of your own body. Right. And the way that the model is going to be built up is that the robot is doing actions uh -huh. and watching itself performing these actions. So to get a relation between the visual image and movement of the motor. So here you see this uh, looking at, uh, at its hand. Uh -huh. And you also see very much how, how it's trying to keep balance. And it's pretty you know, impressive. Actually. How all yeah. these motor, motor commands are s sort of in an early phase, right? Oh, Whoa. So. Well, cool, sir. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yes. So it's, it's just woken up. I know that feeling. It's, uh, OK, OK. Yeah. But it's, uh, I think this was a beautiful example of uh, feedback and, and of finding balance. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It really does look like it's sort of encountering itself for the first time. But what's even more remarkable about Luke's robots is that once they're able to recognize themselves, they start to evolve their own language and communicate with each other. So what's going to happen now? Well, one of them is going to speak, and then he's going to ask the other one to do an action. He is going to invent a word, because he doesn't have yet a word uh -huh. to name that action. Right. Okay, so then he says the word, and this one isn't sure whether what it could mean, right? It's a brand new word. So then he will make a guess, and uh, if the guess is okay, totally uh, by luck, right? Well, they both know this word, and they know for the future they can use this word to communicate with each other. What if it gets it wrong, then? Well, if it gets it wrong, then this one will say that this is not what I had in mind. Right. And he will show it. Okay. I mean, yeah. I don't know which one is going to speak first. Okay, so he's, he's speaking first. He's doing the action. <laughs> That's fantastic. No. Okay, you, you notice how he looked? Now, okay, so now he's, he's recording what? The, the real action. All right. Okay. So now there's another interaction going to happen. Again, I don't know which one is going to speak. Okay, now. Oh, is that speaking. the word it just learned? Kima yes, yes, yes. So, so uh -huh, okay, of so course, he knows like already. Checking. So he's, yeah. Doing, yeah. he's doing it. And he will say yes, presumably, will he? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so would they even interact with me to sort of learn this language? Yeah, we could uh, certainly try it. Right, okay. Do you remember any one of the words? Uh, that, uh, we'll see. Yeah, okay. okay. Mm. This is quite scary. Oh gosh, it's asked me to do something. Kimatu. Um, it was that, wasn't it? Have I got it right? Oh gosh, okay, right, you tell me what Kimatu is. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. All right. Tommy Ma. I think that was lifting my right arm. Let's see, did I get it right? Yes. I'm learning robots. Okay. Um, and I, I, I have to conclude now, but of course this is, these are two robots, right? Now, language is typically a phenomenon that is in a population of robots. And so we do a lot of experiments where we actually have agents that are downloading into the, the body of <laughs> these robots playing a language game, interacting with each other, adjusting to each other, aligning, and then two other agents can use the same sort of bodies, maybe located in, an, in another uh, place in the world. And so this is the way that we study how they can be alignment, or through alignment they can be the convergence of language to a, uh, a shared common language. This is the final image that I want to show you. This is the what's going on in the brain of a single robot as it is doing these interactions. There's already 230 of them. And you see the dynamics of it. You see the continuous creation of new nodes. You see the, um, uh, you know, strength between the nodes. And I'm very happy <laughs> to have a robot that is telling me that I should stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>